Hello and welcome to the Pain Options Education Channel. I'm Darren. And I'm Tim. Nice to see you here again, Tim. Thanks, Tim. We're moving along with the pelvis series here. We're up to management. If you haven't seen our other episodes yet, look back. We've got episodes on the problem of the pelvis, on assessing the pelvis, different assessment paradigms, looking at the subject of examination. Um, all very interesting, I think. But today, management is where we're at. So I've thrown this in here just to remind us where we started back at the, the burden of pelvic girdle pain for people. And it's always important to just remember that this disorder really affects some people. And therefore, you know, we need to acknowledge that and, and then tailor the management to those individuals as we would any other management. But just really, I think the thing that reminds me is just that interaction with family is, is a key one here, uh, something that you need to consider and manage. <laughs> so do you mean by that as in a goal for that person or that's a, a real limiting issue? Well, a goal, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And often you can get for, forgotten, you know, therapists might go on the functional thing, walking or movement, but um, uh, really just to remind you of the overarching burden of these disorders for people and how they affect their lives. <laughs> yeah. Okay, in terms of speaking about management today, we're going to refer to our clinical framework. Maybe Tim, you could just give you a little brief more information on the clinical framework. Sure, so this is the musculoskeletal clinical translation framework. Uh, it's really designed to assist people with their reasoning and understanding of any musculoskeletal pain condition. It's something we've developed as, as part of our teaching program at Curtin University. Uh, there's lots more information out there, including an ebook on this and a recently released app. So we're not gonna go into that in any detail, but just to say the domains or the different contributing factors that are identified in the framework apply in any musculoskeletal condition, but they're very easy to, to talk around here. Yeah. And what's the website where people can get information on that, Tim? Uh, musculoskeletalframework.net. .net? Yeah. And I believe we may see another series of podcasts around the framework. Uh, yeah, when us. we get around to that. Yes. <laughs> but I think importantly, as we talk about management here, this series that we've done isn't all encompassing about pelvic girdle pain, particularly around the assessment side of it. We went through mm -hmm. the physical examination of the pain provocation test to rule the sacroiliac joint in or out. But obviously there's whole other components of your physical evaluation that you would need to do to help you determine what are the different factors contributing to each person's presentation if they do have pelvic girdle or specifically sacroiliac joint pain. Yes, and if, if people have questions about that, they could always um, email us at education at painoptions.com.au. With a dot in there somewhere. Yes. Okay, so, um, well, actually, I've, I've already kind of started with the individual perspective a little bit with that first slide. Um, anything else you wanted to say there? Well, it's quite simple that to understand their perspective, you need to ask them. So yes. how is this affecting you? What are the main problems? What are your goals? So by addressing those questions, you can be quite clear, clear of what's important for each person and therefore that's what you should tailor your management towards. Yeah. Okay, so if we think about, where should we start on this? Where would you like to start? Well, I'll follow down the line there. So if you're talking about diagnosis. diagnosis. So really this is around the education of the person in terms of what's going on. Yep. Yep. And either you've, or well, you have completed that diagnostic triage, either there's a red flag disorder, so it's obviously automatic on referral. It might be a specific diagnosis, so they have sacroiliac joint pain and it's directly related to an underlying condition, for example, a spondyloarthropathy or some sort of focal sacroiliitis, but again, that would be combined with investigations. But broadly, most of the people that we'll see, even though we can localise the pain to the sacroiliac joint, it still fits under that non-specific diagnosis if there's no, I guess, medical diagnosis such as sacroiliitis or stress fracture, for example. Mm -hmm. That is the, a, spe a clear, specific cause of their symptoms. Yeah. Yep. So it's very important to give these people as much information as you can, but not overwhelm them as well. Yep. And 
Um, but I think if, if you've done a thorough examination, and particularly the pain provocation tests, and, and as we've spoken about in terms of locating that symptoms and some kind of acknowledgement that that pelvis is a problem for them, yeah. um, aligning to diagnosis, however you kind of put that, is important. So let's say from a clinician's perspective yeah. or medical speak, we've diagnosed this person with non-specific sacroiliac joint pain. We're obviously not going to say that to the patient. So how would you describe that in words? Like, what would you say if I was the patient? Well, I think if you were the patient, for me, I'd be going, Tim, we've done a thorough assessment here. We've looked at your hips. All the tests I did for your hips were fine. We've looked at your lower back. All the tests we did for your lower back are fine. I know you have that scan that shows a little bit of disc degeneration there, but really nothing I could do provoked your symptoms from your from the spine, I know you've been concerned about that, but I don't think that's an issue at all today based on what we've seen. Does that make sense to you so far? Yeah, I definitely noticed when you pushed pretty hard on my back, that didn't bring on my pain. Exactly. So that makes sense. Yeah. So then we've looked at your sacral joints and we did those five tests, remember, and yeah. four of those were positive, which really tells me that the pelvis seems to be your source of symptoms. Okay. Yeah. So we've kind of localised where your pain's coming from. And now we need to think about, okay, how are we going to move forward? How can you walk properly? Yeah. Okay. So something like that. Good. So that covers the diagnosis. Obviously, the stage is relevant because if someone's presenting with something extremely acute onset, again, is there a trauma or is there a, a mm. medical reason yeah. or a specific reason behind that? Yeah. Um, versus something that's acute but more insidious or again fitting under that non-specific category or then progressing along is this a, a more of a persistent pain problem yeah so if they have an acute pain clearly you've got to manage the acute pain <laughs> yeah all right we won't spend lots on that and then the pain features which really covers around what type of pain it is most people with sacroiliac joint pain will have nociceptive pain there may be inflammatory pain um, in some conditions like mm -hmm. we've already talked about um, and then there's also other potentially neuropathic or nosoplastic pain types as well, which may coexist, but the vast majority of people will have nociceptive pain associated with sacroiliac joint pain. Yeah. Do you think that's fair to say? Well, yes, and certainly that's been the focus of this series around, around that. Yeah. Otherwise, you'd be probably looking at a different kind of um, classification around the diagnosis, really. Yeah. Uh, something more to pain sensitivity or a specific diagnosis. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, as we just said a minute ago, if, if pain's the primary issue, you've got to manage that in the first instance. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. So, yeah. so we've talked about the type of pain and then also under pain features, we talk about how mechanical or non-mechanical it is, yeah. which is obviously very important because if someone's got mechanical nociceptive pain, there's clear aggravating and easing factors. So we might be able to apply... Um, treatments or advice around that which can then help them modify what they're doing alter load through their system for example to help reduce that pain in their aggravating activities or alternately advise them to avoid aggravating it for a period so that's the more straightforward ones yeah if it's more on the non-mechanical end you've got to look at the other different contributing factors listed on the yeah. slide there that might be driving that ongoing broader non-mechanical presentation yeah so let's let's pick up on that point around trying to change the way people load their pelvis and, yeah. and move what kind so we're moving into the functional behaviors here a bit i know but what kind of things management wise would be useful strategies you think for for people to see with this problem sure well, obviously that's guided by our physical examination but if it's fairly mechanical pain you would look at someone how they're loading on their leg and that might be to do with what's happening around too much or too little trunk muscle activity or um, muscle function around their pelvic region, then obviously the mechanics of loading on their leg and muscle strength and movement patterns around that. So those types of physical components might be quite relevant to either increasing muscle support for some people or reducing muscle support for others. They would be obvious ones. Yeah. What about others? Yeah, no, I think they're the obvious ones and, and, and just really thinking of those loading problems that we've spoken about are a problem for these people. Um, so walking, sit to stand, um, impact with jumping or running, yeah. and also uh, potentially rolling as well. Yeah. 
And that comes, the psychosocial uh, factors are next, which is your cognitive, which is your thoughts and beliefs. Mm. And that often ties into that physical examination where the people that, say, think their pelvis is unstable or are mm. very concerned or fearful about their pain, that'll manifest in a physical response of often more unhelpful protective guarding. So usually you're combining that with can you show these people you can modify their pain, mm. not just talking about it and telling them not to worry about it. Yep. So those often, there are often relaxation strategies there combined with looking at retraining how they're moving or how they're loading. That can become, it's educative, but it obviously has a clear physical change in symptoms at times as well. And probably to give them some confidence in their body. So if they've had fear or catastrophizing around a loose or unstable pelvis, yeah. um, you know, if you can work through the assessment, kind of bring them on board around that not being the issue, show them, you know, with some other strategies to control their pain, then they can start to build on, on their confidence in their body and their pelvis in particular. Yeah. Um, aligning with that, obviously the cognitive is education. Yeah. as well as but showing them and them experiencing a, a competent assessment would be very helpful. Mm. Then we're looking at effective or mood factors in there as well. So some of that mood is directly impacted by their pain or lack of control or clear plan. So sometimes you can improve mood, not by treating mood, but giving a clear yes. path forward. Yep. For other people, mood is a dominant driver and maybe there's other health professionals needed to be involved. The other one around that is cardiovascular exercise we know is a great uh, modifier for mood and can be highly effective in, in managing that but also helping reduce symptoms. So broadly for most of these patients we'd be trying to get them to do something cardiovascular wise but what that looks like entirely depends on the person. Yeah, yeah. and the challenges of the, the pregnant lady in these situations, yeah. how do you kind of deal with that? Well. Exercise in pregnancy is <laughs> safe and healthy and there's lots of positives around that. Yeah. So my approach, I guess, isn't that much different other than being aware that they're pregnant. So there's some limitations around that or the level of intensity of exercise later in the pregnancy may need to be modified, but broadly the rules apply. So the lower end of the scale is exercising in water because there's less load on, but you can still get people to, to work um, often exercise bike can be an option for some but not all with sacroiliac joint pain um, then there's your whole range of any other cardiovascular option as well cross trainer often works well for someone if you haven't got the impact load yeah. and you reduce the length of the stride on the cross trainer for example yeah good tip but it's very individualized around that of course of course and um, also so, so what about the person, and we're kind of on the cognitive issues here, who is just steadfast in the, when you've spoken to them that their pelvis is out, yeah. you know, they've almost come to say, I need you to put my pelvis back in. Yeah. How do you manage that? Well, I think the first step to that is understanding why they think that. Yeah. So how they come to that understanding or belief, because mm -hmm. that's perhaps, then it becomes an issue of, if they're open to modifying that belief, then you're a chance in around your education. If they're rigidly held on that, then that's a, another challenge and you have to be careful pushing too hard. Yeah, that's the backfire effect where you um, confront someone with a false belief who has with the truth and it um, actually forces them further into their false belief. So clearly that can happen with these yeah. people, but predicting who might go that way or not could be, could be difficult. But... Yeah. Maybe there's some people where, um, you know, your process that we've talked through through the examination can kind of bring them around to a new way of thinking, or perhaps others, you, you, you can kind of avoid it a bit. And if you, if you provide them an alternate plausible hypothesis or you give them control over their symptoms through changing movement strategies or something like that, then yeah. that underlying belief becomes less important. Yeah, I'll often say to these people, don't trust me, let's mm -hmm. test this. And we've just given you things to do that don't hurt. Yeah. In fact, they make your symptoms better. Yes. How about you go and repeat that a few times and even diarise it to be really clear and then come back and check in. And then if they have that repeated experience themselves of, hang on, I can do more and it actually hurts less, mm -hmm. then again, that you can build on that over time. You don't have to solve it all in one go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, what about specific exercise for these people? And I guess I'm getting away from thinking about specific changing of movement patterns to specific muscle strengthening or stretching. Sure. Where, where does that fit in your yeah. mind? <laughs> I'll come to that. Okay. But on the pain features, the one thing we didn't talk about was pain sensitivity. Yeah. So people that are really high on the sensitivity on specific exercise, possibly useless. Yeah. People that are much more mechanical and low on sensitivity, then specific exercise might be relevant. Now, the specific exercises I see are in two parts. One is specific relaxation exercises because of through your physical assessment, you've shown that reducing trunk muscle tone or tension in the pelvic muscles can be really helpful and we know working with women's health or women's and men's pelvic health physios mm -hmm. that excess uh, pelvic floor muscle tone is a common feature in people with pelvic girdle and pelvic pain and that again ties into the other um, pelvic symptoms as well yes so the relaxation of that can be very important but there are a proportion of people that often a high tone in the trunk, but actually have very poor muscle conditioning around their hips, thighs and pelvis, for example, where they might need to be individual targeted strengthening. If you're doing that though, you've shown that in your physical examination. Yeah. You're not plucking that out of the air mm. or out of your butt to say, yeah, you've got to do glute exercises because they're the favorite exercises. Mm. You've actually tested that and shown it's clearly weaker than the other side. Mm and then given some clear exercise parameters around strength, which is three times a week, not three times a day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah excellent. Uh, okay, what else? Let's think about what we've got here. Oh, I guess you did mention comorbidities there. Yeah. Um, so involving other healthcare professionals in management of those comorbidities can be very important. I mean, I've said before, and you've also worked with women's health physios closely. Yeah. So there's a real synergy there. Correct. So referral to other physiotherapists with different expertise. Um, often referral back or communication with the GP around pain management options mm -hmm. can be appropriate. Um, possibly further on referral from there if required. And then psychologists are the other ones that are often helpful if there is a clear sort of dominant or driving um, psychological component and that person agrees that that's something that they see as important and are then open to seeking more assistance around that. Mm. Um, obviously people have for example exercise physiologists and if they've already got some supervised exercise program we might communicate with them around specific recommendations to allow them to keep exercise but modifying that to address the targets. Mm that we found. Yeah, and just remembering, and you, you kind of touched on it before, around not every person with uh, psychological distress will need no. psychological intervention and and will not form psychological intervention, but particularly, you know, for many women, pregnancy can be a time of worry and stress, particularly around, you know, the health of their baby. So, but if, if you can manage the pain and give them confidence in their body, then, then the worry and threat of that kind of dissipates. Sure, and that's why we have the screening questionnaires, such as the Orobro, so you can track that. If everything else is getting better but the mood's not, then you might revisit that with the person to see if that is something they want additional help addressing if it's still relevant. Yeah, good, good. So we've got the psychosocial. We haven't quite mentioned the social, which is more understanding the home environment, and that yeah. also flows to work considerations around understanding their work environment if they're at work. Yeah because those factors can often, in my experience, contribute to them not being able to get symptom relief because they're having to do things yeah, if they've already got exactly, kids at home. Exactly what I was thinking, yeah. yeah. But keeps re-aggravating their symptoms. So discussions around that mm. and getting assistance or stepping back and asking for help, they can be the key factors in helping someone recover. Yeah, that's right. And it can be tricky when someone's managing young kids and there's, there's limited support. So yeah. having um, strategies around that might be important. And then yeah. the same definitely goes for work. And that's obviously not just for women, but men with sacroiliac joint pain. And as you mentioned, the higher demand physical labor jobs mm -hmm. that require high load transmission through the pelvis, often work duties are a factor. Yeah. yeah. And then a, a, a graduated program as with anyone, but particularly because of the impact being an aggravating activity for these people. Often, you know, going from a 
a series of exercises that relate to impact through to running 10Ks can be quite a step. So you need to have a graduated return to impact-based activity yeah. um, and manage that carefully. Mm. And that comes under the lifestyle because some people are allergic to exercise, <laughs> others are probably pushing and doing too much. So there's that balance between understanding their picture and encouraging yeah. the appropriate levels yeah. and understanding their goals of what they want to get back to. Yeah, so in this cohort, there's definitely the avoiders and yeah. the warriors, but there's definitely those that will uh, over-push. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, okay, so let's go back through it. Stage of disorder we've been through. Pain features, I think we covered what we wanted to there. Yeah. Psychosocial considerations we've got. We've mentioned work, lifestyle, whole person considerations are important. That's where the comorbidities we've spoken about. Yeah. And functional behaviours are, are clearly a necessary part of this, um, you know, your assessment that leads straight on to, to management. Yeah, and just to be clear, we're not, I guess, advocating this is your assessment routine and this is how you go about it. Mm. Because like we said earlier on in one of the earlier series on the subjective interview, you need to listen to the story and have your diagnostic hypotheses and then tailor your physical exam around that. Yeah. So you may have ruled the sacroiliac joint in as a source of symptoms, but then is it mechanical and are those symptoms modifiable like we've talked about? Mm. Or if it's more pain sensitivity or more non-mechanical, then the physical targeted specific exercises or treatments are probably not likely to be helpful. It's got to be looking more broadly at the other factors that are likely driving the mm. presentation for that person. Yeah, and I, so you could, uh, you know, a clinician could say, well, how's this different from managing the back? And you'd probably say, not that different. Correct. Yeah. Uh, but there, there still is an importance of understanding, you know, where the patient's symptoms are coming from. And if you look back at one of our past episodes, there was a story about a, a chap that fell down the stairs that would give you some indication of why that's important. But yeah, management of the, of the lumbo-pelvic area. I mean, they're functionally integrated units, so you can't do it in isolation anyway. Yeah. Uh, but, but, yeah, management's similar. Yeah, and I think one other thought from my end is if you take those factors we talked about, when you assess them at the start and you apply some management, those factors or the weighting of them will change over time. So you need to revisit that as you're going along because the priority day one by the time you've seen the person a few times and hopefully they've engaged in the plan, mm -hmm. it's probably modified. So again, your targets for management will need to shift as they evolve. Yeah, yeah. good, good. All right. So I'm glad we put this slide in because neither of us spoke about belts in terms of management. Um, I did do a study on this a couple of years ago, uh, change, uh, assessing practice behaviours between physiotherapists in Norway and Australia around these case scenarios, but one of them was around pregnancy-related pain. We basically gave them a big list of things that they would do as priorities in management. So in Australia, for this case, belts were in the top five. In Norway, they didn't didn't rate. <laughs> so it's quite interesting. So that's... is that because Norwegians have different types of pelvic girdle pain? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> we talked about medicalization of the problem over there, but yeah. maybe uh, a belt would help medicalization. Um, but it, but it is um, it, it is interesting that um, you know disorders that aren't going to be that different really that the treatment approaches country to country would be different around belts certainly they're very popular um, in Australia yeah mm. so, so do, you, do you use them well certainly not as a go to um, first instance give everyone a belt um, yeah. um, I think. Certainly they can help pain control for some people. So if you can't find other ways to control their pain by changing the way they move, uh, then yes, that might be something you want to do. Uh, particularly then, as we said, if someone's got kids, they have to keep looking after them. That's a way to yeah. take the load off. That might be a smart thing to do. I think you've got to be a little careful with belts um, in that often they become uncomfortable or they lose their effectiveness. So maybe not wearing one all the time, just using it when, when you know you're in a situation that might be problematic for you would be the way to go. I but think my read is if a belt helps because it's giving some sort of additional external support, maybe that allows the person to relax a bit, mm. maybe it adds a little bit more mm. um, tension to the system for some people, mm. but it makes them feel better. But if you're needing a belt, then it tells you the system's quite sensitive to load 
Mm. So then I'd also be going, do they need medication? Maybe, maybe not. Mm. Should they be looking at other factors around taking more load off the system to allow it to calm down? Mm. Odd, odd patients that are highly irritable and it's acute, maybe putting them on crutches, for example, for a very short period can be helpful because it really just reflects the system needs to mm. calm down. Mm. But that sorting the problem out or that reflecting that their pelvis is unstable clearly doesn't hold up. Mm. Well, I think that's very insightful, Tim. And if anybody's having trouble sleeping at night, they could go and get a copy of my PhD. And there's a chapter on um, pelvic compression in there. And actually, what we found is that everybody was better with compression. That was an inclusion criteria. But yeah. when we looked at EMG activity, um, you know, across those subjects, it kind of fell two ways. Some had actually decreased their activity and others had increased, which is exactly what you said. Maybe you read it and you didn't know. No. <laughs> but of course yes, I read it. Oh yes, <laughs> I can guarantee that's a good one to put you to sleep at night if you're, if you're suffering from right. insomnia. Uh, okay, that's more than enough on pelvic belts. I don't know what's next. Let's see, we might be surprised. Oh, it's time for questions. But before that, do you have any any other statements or questions, I guess, around pelvic girdle pain now we've reached the, the management milestone? Yeah, no statements, but if I had a question, what would I do about that? Ah, uh, yes, yes. Well, you could um, you could email, yes, to education at painoptions.com.au. Yes. Thanks, Darren. Yeah, and I, I think um, maybe in about 12 months someone might answer that. Uh, we'll be on to it tomorrow. Mm. All right, very good. Well, thank you very much again. And uh, we do have uh, two more add-ons to this topic, I guess. We, we've got one around the symphysis pubis and run around the coccyx, so... They'll be coming to you at some point. Um, otherwise, good night. Thanks. Tim, we're back sooner than expected because I thought of a question while we were off air. And what I wanted to ask you about was non-conservative management of sacroiliac disorders, particularly around surgery. And um, just, you know, what your experiences are with that. Um, it's certainly a controversial topic in the world of surgery. And yep. the literature is very two-sided on this. Um, but what, have you got any thoughts or comments? Well, from a, I like to go with a logical argument, mm -hmm. and it's at least logic that I agree with. Yeah. <laughs> and that is surgery traditionally is done on something when it's broken or there's some clear structural issue with it. So the justification for doing surgery is around repair, for example, or like you do a joint replacement because the joint surface is in the knee or the hip are damaged, for example. Whereas surgery for sacroiliac joint pain is usually in the form of a fusion of the joint mm -hmm. is the most common surgery, is that yes. fair to say? Yeah. So the question is, why would you fuse it? Question one logically would be, or reason one would be because it's unstable. And we've kind of blown that out of the water well, yeah. previous research has clearly blown that out of the water, except in that very small group of people where high-level trauma, trauma yeah. has caused separation or uh, true instability of the joint. So you could mount a case in that instance where surgical stabilisation might be relevant. But personally, I don't see any other reasons why you should be fusing or stabilising a joint that's mm -hmm. not stable I know arguably they do that around the ankle joint. It would mm. be a joint where fusion of a joint can provide pain management outcomes. But as we know now, pain in that region might not be only due to issues mm. within the joint. The classic is the 20% of people that don't get pain improvement following hip or knee joint replacement. Yeah. And that's so, definitely, yeah, when conservative management has completely failed in the ankle, isn't it? Yeah, it has. It is. That's the reason why. Yeah. So arguably, could you go down that line of surgery when appropriate conservative management has been applied and has failed? Mm. Possibly, but as we know, there are risks with surgery, so you need to go into that, you know, very fully. Yeah, and you, you kind of touched on the concept of risk factors for poor outcomes on surgery, you know, comorbidities around pain, comorbidities, more widespread or... A pain or pain sensitivity, 
smoking, mm-hmm. um, um, dominant psych issues or that are you know a significant factor in the person's condition. Uh, there's probably another one or two that I, oh, obesity is one yeah. as well. So so those um, clear risk factors for poor outcome from surgery need to be uh, considered. Yeah, yeah. The other one around beliefs, and we've talked a little bit about this previously, is if someone's convinced their pelvis is unstable and they're convinced nothing else will help them other than surgery, could you mount a case, well, if they don't have those other risk factors, Mm -hmm. arguably they might have psychosocial ones, but Mm -hmm. if they don't have those other risk factors, is it the case that surgery might help them because they believe it will? And if so, is that (laughs) justification for surgery? I don't know. I don't know either. Um, you know, we should state clearly that we're not surgeons and thankfully we don't really have to make decisions around this. Because um, I'm sure there's patients out there in the literature and some that we've seen that have had a good response following surgery. Yeah, exactly. But similar to the manual therapy debate, why is that? Or the treatments of pelvic asymmetry debate, yes, people get better, but is it for the reasons we think? Yeah, yeah, good. Well, I think we can say goodbye for properly this time, so. Until we have another question. Yes.